um, I'm particularly excited about the conversation. We kind of touched on this a second ago, like edge is one of these buzzwords that just gets thrown around a lot. Most people seem to have the perspective or it's easy to have the perspective that like the edge fixes everything, like all the problems we've ever had. And the reality is to your point, like there's lots of benefits with the edge, especially in terms of performance, but the tooling and the ecosystem has to catch up with it to support that. And that leads to lots of challenges and it leads to innovation too, which is part of what we'll talk about today. So um, I'll let you do, uh, introduce yourself and then we'll kind of introduce the idea of Torso and then uh, we'll talk through what the edge means, how the impact is, like do a hands-on demo. So if people have questions about the edge, serverless, databases, specific features of the, of the product that we're going to cover, throw those in the chat and we'll make sure to cover all of those. Um, in the meantime, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about your background? Absolutely. Before I do that, James, <clears throat> first of all, just for your audience, I am a little bit late, <laughs> so don't mind. Uh, I, I don't usually sound like a duck that much. Uh, and I don't see the chat because I'm just on, on your stream platform. Should I open YouTube? Or are you going to read it? Uh, you can see yeah. So I'll, I'll pay attention to comments, but there is a comments tab in oh, StreamYard in the dashboard. So you should be able to see everything coming in from YouTube and... Amazing. So just to just to prove, if you're listening in live, leave a comment in the chat so so we can all see it and verify it's coming through. Yeah, yeah. Aerospike is a name. Blaze was mentioned. That was one of our main competitors at Scylla for the. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, but going going straight uh, going straight there uh, into my background. Uh, first, uh, nice to meet you all. Pleasure to be here with you, James. I'm Glauber Costa. Um, I've been doing software in general for a long time. I started in last century, let's say, in the Linux kernel. Uh, so my uh, back back then, this stuff wasn't WebAssembly, was actual assembly. Uh, I've done a lot of work in file systems, in virtualization with the Zen hypervisor, with the KVM hypervisor, uh, x86 boot sequence, uh, file systems, all, all sorts of stuff like that. A, a little bit of containers as well when Docker was emerging. Like the, I wrote some of the uh, resource accounting parts uh, of the container infrastructure for Linux. Uh, at the time, that's when I met my co-founder, Pekka. Pekka was also working with Linux. He was the maintainer of the memory management subsystem. So we worked a little bit together and in different companies, in different uh, setups, but together. And later I joined a company called Scylla. Uh, the company was actually doing something else, was doing a kernel in C++. And then we pivoted into Scylla. Uh, which was a petabyte scale NoSQL database. So my background, I mean, I'm fairly new to web. Uh, <laughs> probably like a, you would all run laps around me on that. But the, my background is really from like deep infrastructure and low level systems. And now uh, we are putting out Turso, Turso an edge database, which is, um, as, as we mentioned, Nibi just say SillaDB is awesome. They really are. Uh, it's fantastic. And you've probably seen recently just a shameless plug in here, their work with Discord. Uh, I was working with Discord when Discord initially started engaging, and that that was years and years and years ago. Uh, Are now they using SiloDB, they they published an article the other day that uh, got shared a bunch of times, like the okay. uh, did on on his stream, like a readout on on the article in which they told their journey. So for me, it was very personal mm. to read that article. Yeah. The journey that started when I was there yep. many years back, uh, and only now finishing. So, but like I come from the, essentially the database world. Um, and now uh, with an Edge database. Nice. I love that. I'm going to ask a favor in the chat. Maybe if you have a chance to grab that link and, and share it in the chat for other people to see, I'd love to, to yeah. read about that. Um, I, like my, my first kicking off point, I think, and, and we'll, try to like, we'll try to move quickly through kind of the talking points and then get into hands-on demo and like use that as talking points. But like, first just kind of concept for people if they haven't heard of the edge or even if they've heard the buzzword but don't really know like what does the edge actually mean in modern architecture and deployment awesome um i i wrote an article about that recently as well that i can recommend uh i don't know if i'm gonna have the if I, I'm, I'm afraid of getting out of this stab but then <laughs> <laughs> like You're if you are a blog uh, on a website uh, recently there was a blog called what the heck is the edge anyway uh just for folks in the audience that want to have a deeper dive. But essentially, the edge uh, is the boundary between you and the cloud, uh, so, so to say. right? And the reason this is uh, <clears throat> sometimes confusing 
is that folks from IoT were already using that term and they have a different understanding of what the edge really is. Like, so the edge for IoT folks uh, is usually like uh, cell towers or like uh, things that are POI, point of sales devices, mm -hmm. like things like really close to you, like almost the, the, at the device itself. Uh, and there is an interesting characteristic because those devices, they can go offline anytime. So when you, when you talk about edge, uh, from the IoT context, you're talking about things that can come and go. So, so the important thing, uh, and there are databases that try to cater to that market. And usually, what they're talking about is like an offline first applications. You know, your cell phone, and you don't have connectivity. And then batch uh, updates and later then on. Batch updates, yeah. etc., or sync with the nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, right? But recently, uh, through platforms like Cloudflare. Uh, Dino, now Vercel, Netlify are all adopting similar things with edge functions. The web uh, also started to use the term edge. Is it the wrong use of the term? No, <laughs> because I mean, the definition is, is still like a, this boundary between the cloud yeah. and, and you. Uh, but the biggest difference from the old edge is that this edge is always online, right? Um, it just, it, you don't expect Cloudflare not to be online. When you mm -hmm. write your edge functions on, on Netlify Edge, you don't expect that this function may or may not have internet connectivity. Uh, so what really what that means is that you have, whereas in the cloud you had three regions, maybe four regions that you could architect your application to be, now on the edge, you're really talking about the last mile. You're talking about uh, maybe 20 regions. We currently, at, with Torso, we support 26 regions, uh, so you, or we call them locations, uh, but you support up to 26 locations in which you can actually put your data uh, and your code is going to be uh, somewhere in those locations as well. So instead of having like this 30 millisecond round trip to uh, San Francisco, you can get a data center that is much closer to you, James, that you're in the Midwest, for example, and save 10 milliseconds, 15 mm -hmm. milliseconds worth of latency that in some situations, as we've been discussing, is, is the difference between business that you won and, and business that you lost, right? Yeah, yeah the, the big epitome for me was... It was in the last year or two, and I guess it was maybe when Vercel first introduced edge functions, and I just wasn't getting it. Like I, I wasn't understanding like what edge versus serverless. And what I didn't realize or just hadn't quite like specifically thought about was serverless functions. I thought of serverless meaning they could be anywhere, but they were still deployed in a specific region. Like they are deployed in US East or they're deployed in, in Europe yeah. one or like whatever the different regions are. But then the edge functions are at all of these different locations in theory, could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever, however many you have. Reason, but the reason you have this confusion is that all the folks that were doing edge at the web were doing edge using the serverless abstraction. Mm. So kind of, but yeah, right. It's not, it's not necessarily the case. So if you go to Fly.io, mm -hmm. for example, uh, we built our tech on Fly.io, where you can use Fly.io to deploy Anything. You still have the server abstraction. So on Fly.io, you essentially have a Docker file that you get your long-running servers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use this for your compute as well. And we are again, we are using to build our data plane because for a data service, you need like long-lived things. I can't have something that a database that only lasts for 20 milliseconds <laughs> at the time of the request. So those things are different, and you can have. Uh, but the reason people conf uh, get confused with them is that most of the folks doing serve doing edge uh, at the web are also doing serverless, serverless. well. Yeah. But they don't have to be the same thing. You can have edge that is not serverless, and you can have serverless that is not edge, uh, as you mentioned yourself. Uh, and then you go to that region, and you always AWS Lambda, for example, is not edge. You, when you run, you're going to run in in a region, right? In a specific region, yeah. It is, and that's we talked about this earlier. Like that's where things have gotten so much more complicated. The just the idea of serverless, and then yeah. the idea of edge, and the fact that most of what the edge is is combined with serverless. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a fun landscape because of the things that we get to take advantage of, but it also gets like more and more complicated. Um, I think I, if you're good with it, we can do like hands-on portion and we'll start with just like setting up a database through the CLI. So we'll go through that and then we're going to incorporate that into a basic, very basic node application. And then we'll do the thing we haven't quite talked about is the replication of um, instances or nodes or, or however you want to phrase it of our database and then show the impact that uh, replications in specific places are going to have. And, uh, and we'll actually see like the timing of that. Should I tell your audience a little bit more about what exactly Torso is in that landscape? Before? Yeah, go for it. 
Yeah. Yeah, so again, Turso, <coughs> Turso is an edge database. I, I think that much people figure from mm -hmm. the context. Uh, but it's built. Uh, we it's built on top of a pro an open source project that we maintain and, and are the main contributors to called LibSQL. Uh, LibSQL is essentially a fork of SQLite. Uh, so the reason, uh, if you look into the new edge database landscape, lots of people have been looking into SQLite as a building block uh, for for that foundation. And the reason for that is that SQLite is extremely small. It's extremely lean. Uh, can fit everywhere. And again, when you talk about data centers, uh, the edge is also data centers. You know that it's the common joke on Twitter, serverless, there is a server. At some There's point. server, yeah. Serverless oh, doesn't right? actually mean without servers. Exactly. <laughs> it means you it's don't care the about them. Just the abstraction yeah. that's different. So it's not that the edge doesn't involve data centers. It's just that it's uneconomical to put a giant ass data center uh, like AWS US East One in any one of those hundreds of mm -hmm. locations. So you, you tend to have like things that are a lot weaker in terms of compute power. Uh, they have fewer resources. So SQLite really is a database that blends very well into that paradigm because it uses so few resources. Uh, the problem with SQLite is obviously that it's local only. There is nothing that you can do. Like a, it's not a database that is built for distribution, uh, for, for accessing over the, over the wire or anything like that. And there were a couple of projects that when we started looking into Tour, so there were a couple of projects that were Figuring, okay, so given this limitation that SQLite cannot be changed because the SQLite project is it, it's not very um, uh, in practice, they don't accept contributions. Like uh, I, I saw, like their founder once said, "Well, we do accept contributions, but uh, if you go to the website, they're very explicit about saying we're not open contribution. Like you, you can ask for something, we may write a patch to do it. We're not going to take your code. LightFS is, is indeed an example." Uh, I love those projects, but they all were uh, essentially looking around, okay, SQLite cannot be changed uh, because they won't accept those contributions. So how do we do, uh, how do we do this? Like what kind of infrastructure do we have to create? So you look at LightFS, for example, that Nibi uh, mentioned in the chat, uh, it, you have, you depend on infrastructure like console. Uh, you have lots of stuff that you have to do. You have essentially a user space file system that tries to understand what are you writing to this file, intercept those file writes. So we decided to just fork it. So LibSQL is a fork of SQLite. Uh, it is used for, we want this to see this used for a lot more than what we're doing. Again, we come from Linux, we come from this background of like heavy open source stuff. We believe SQLite could be something like that, uh, you know, if, if, you, if it was more open. So there are, all, there are tons of stuff in, in, in LibSQL that are not that relevant for tools. So you can, for example, uh, do uh, WebAssembly user-defined functions. There's a bunch of other stuff that we're doing as well. Support for CRDTs are coming, although that one we actually want to incorporate in tools so, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, some of them contributed to, from community members, right? Uh, so we built that project. So we, we've been maintaining this, this fork. Uh, we, you could say we sponsor the fork. Uh, because we do want to make it open for contrib contributions from anywhere. And then on top of that, we build Turso. Uh, Turso is essentially a server mode version of LibSQL that is ac accessible over HTTP and web sockets. Because another thing that we haven't mentioned about those serverless environments is that you don't have much to work with. Uh, you can't just open arbitrary TCP connections. Uh, again, the, the functions themselves, they usually will have like a V8 executor and HTTP and web sockets, and that's it, right? So for, to have your database accessible from those environments, not only you want to be closed, but you want to match the resource, the, the, the resource constraints that the, those environments have. So Turso, massively replicated SQLite uh, of a version of SQLite, SQLite compatible. Uh, we support uh, up to 26, 26 regions. For the free tier, you can create up to three, uh, but uh, for uh, we have a scalar plan coming up later, uh, hopefully in a couple of months. That will that in in which you can create all of those locations and accessible over HTTP. Yeah. HTTP part is yeah. pretty important. There's been, I, I feel like it's becoming more of an accepted protocol for modern quote unquote modern databases yeah. because of how many people are leveraging serverless to be able to to connect to the database instead of those like long standing uh, database connections yeah. and more and transactional. Only Opening the connections is yet another example of those factors uh, that Theo mentioned mm -hmm. that come before you even consider like the mm -hmm. time it takes to run the database. So imagine if you're doing like, if you're trying to shove a traditional stack into a serverless slash edge stack, 
you're going to be downloading those incredibly big binaries and then you're going to be establishing connection pools. Mm -hmm. All of that takes a lot more time than the database, right? So you, you really need to fix the whole thing and being able to talk over HTTP is crucial. Right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Jamie Barton in the chat mentioned reading uh, some of the Torso docs yesterday for an integration. I'm curious what sort of integration he might be Me too. looking at. But yeah, that'd be yes, fun so to know. Yeah. We have a Discord channel as well in which we're talking all, all things Edge and Torso. Mm, yeah. Sure if you have the link up there, James. Let's see if I... Is there a short link like from Torso.tech, like yeah. slash community? Yeah, on the website, we have the links as well, of course. It's just a... Uh join our discord there we go let me throw this in the chat for people in case you want to join this is always the best like slacks and discords for me are always the best for um for like i guess maybe not exactly support but for conversation and learning and question and answer that sort of stuff which i guess is kind of support but i feel like it's just so much more convenient than throwing something out into a, a bigger forum right. and never hearing anything back just personally so i love when companies have like discords and slacks for people to use well, most of the Discord these days, like Slack, yeah. is, it could be worse, it could be Microsoft. <laughs> Slack is seen as so corporate, right? Just mm -hmm. uh, and it got, yeah. for, there, there are times in which Slack is better, but like for community, I like just people showing up. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think Discord is much better. Yep. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so people should see. So I'm on the CLI documentation. I can throw this in the chat for people if you want to kind of look through this as well. So all the stuff that we're going to do just from creating a database and then uh, like adding dummy data basically is going to be from the terminal in this case. Um, so I can start with a brew install and Blaze has a question in the chat. Don't see a community addition in Torso. Is that like... Yeah, not sure, not sure what Blaze means because like we do have the... Actually, all we have now is a free tier, right? Everything mm -hmm. is free. Uh, we're gonna and and whatever is free today, we're making the commitment that uh, that plan is free forever. We'll maintain okay. And that plan is gonna stay like that. What we're gonna add in a couple of months is a pay plan. Uh, but you have cool. the free tier, and also as I mentioned, uh, the tech is open source. If you go to LibSQL, uh, LibSQL is the core. But then inside the LibSQL organization, there is a repository called SQL D, in which you have the server mode, right? So it's all open source. Mm -hmm. uh, the control plane, of course, is uh, the service that we sell. Uh, the control plane replication backups and management but uh it, this is all open source uh, nope. <laughs> cries and heroku promises so. oh <laughs> that's fair that's it's a it's a i was on heroku for a long time with many free tiers that was like like easily my answer for deploying a node app and i still have my the uh discord bot for the learn build teach discord is i was already paying for a tier so i'm mm -hmm have kept that there and love it, but it is, it is sad to see that go away, but you heard it on stream that <laughs> this one will stay around. <laughs> um, the cool. Thing, so I have, this thing that, the yeah, Heroku, I mean, that happens a lot through acquisitions, right? Acquisitions are, yeah. Like, this is a bigger subject, but every time you have your company acquired, uh, those things can happen. Just to... mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, so have the, uh, CLI installed, just did a version check to, to make sure. And then from here, we need to log in. So this is going to like behind the scenes, this like generates some sort of auth token and saves it securely or whatever so that it knows that I'm logged in and connected to like my account and enter. So, right. Yeah. All right. So let's run this. I won't blame them if they reduce the free tier. Got to pay the bills. It, it, I mean, that's like, it's constant struggle, right? And this is one of the interesting things when I was at PlanetScale was finding out how much it costs to maintain a free account because that there is cost. So even if you have limits, right, there's still costs associated with, yeah. with the infrastructure that supports that. Um, so it's definitely, I mean, as a business, as a business leader, as a, as a company, like it's, those are things that you have to figure out and, and kind of work through. Uh, for people, I'm going through this for the first time, by the way. So I'm actually doing like the full uh, login with GitHub. The credentials have been generated. This should be good to go. And I can come back and that should have finished. So I should be good. Yeah. Um, when you run so, this for the first time, we actually tell mm -hmm. you what the next step is. If you run this again, we're not going to be telling you this. We're so mm -hmm. happy here. It's okay. So we don't want to okay. be too nudgy, right? But like the, yep. when it's your first time, hey, 
here's what the next step should look like. Cool. Um, Doug in the chat, who is also from uh, Torso, if you want to go through the process of creating a database and making a replica, suggest the walkthrough tutorial link in the first paragraph of the CLI docs. Back up here. Yeah, we can do that. Which I assume everything I've done so far is basically yeah. the same. But that's a this is a good a good one I think for people to reference as like slightly more specifically hands on. So I'll I'll throw that in the chat too. And this should be same. So we verified that. We then did um, we're logged in, so we should be good. And then actually this is interesting. So our first command is torso db locations. Yeah, so these are when we talk about the edge. These are all the all the different locations that we have the ability to. It looks like did you say twenty six earlier? It looks like around twenty or so. Yeah, it should be twenty to twenty six. I think. Okay. Uh, I ha I had the twenty six number in mind, but it, <laughs> you know, this comes from Flyder I O. So by the way, mm. uh, we don't we don't have our own data centers. Just... Yep. And is that um. Is that all of the locations that Fly has, or did you choose like these are the twenty to twenty six that we specifically pretty, want to work pretty with? Pretty much all of them, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so we can go ahead and create our first database. One thing um, that will be nice eventually, and I don't know. Let me see if it. Yeah, I am. Uh, so one thing that you sh we should look into for the CLI is to get integration into FIG. Have you seen or heard of FIG before? Uh, what? FIG IO. So it's giving me like the IntelliSense in the terminal. And so if I do like NPM install, I don't know, node, and then I want to do node mon, like it's actually giving me IntelliSense for packages. So it has uh, IntelliSense for, um, for CLI tools as well. So having that integrated into FIG would be really good. Really, it's, yeah, it's really cool. And you picked, uh, hopefully, this is the closest location to you, right? Just uh... mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in kind of in talking before, we had talked about doing the opposite of creating one initially far away to show that it would be slower than, than creating one we here. But we'll do this. Yeah. We'll reverse it and have like close and then deploy an instance far away and see if we can force it to, to make a request over there. Uh, and then I assume this is kind of similar to what you said yeah. earlier. Like these are just details. Like first time you're going through, here's some stuff you could do. That's right. Cool. And then we're not there yet, but the replicate command. Uh, so you just give it like replicate the name of my DB. Did I? Okay. So I probably should have named that better, but, um, and then just the location. <laughs> so it's your DB, James. Yeah, I know. It is my, that's what in teaching. So I taught like game development a lot in workshops. And so they give you like, text one, text two, button one, button two by default. And like no one ever renamed. And it was so frustrating because it would be like text 55. And I'm like, I don't know what this is for. <laughs> like trying to debug that is impossible. And now we, I've made the same uh, mistake that they made. Now we're obviously in our monitoring internally. Uh, we see the database has been created, destroyed. So we know who's mm -hmm. following the tutorial. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, cool. So... Uh, so, by the way, if we wanted to have created something um, originally in a different location, we could have passed the dash dash location and we could have done that elsewhere. Uh, Tommy Williams says that you met at Jamstack. Yeah, Conf. nice nice to see you again, Tommy. I'm jealous of Jamstack yeah. Conf specifically because every day I, feel, I hear about someone else that met at Jamstack Conf and I feel like I missed out so much by not going. Well, 2023, James. I know. Yes, that's uh, that's my plan. So we'll see how many different uh, conferences I get to this year with maybe coming in May. Uh, but I would love to make it to Jamstack Conf if I can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this to the clipboard. But just running this like show command, which is basically showing us details about the um, about the database. Most importantly, probably is the URL, which we will use to actually do the connections eventually in the SDK. Uh, uh, Tommy is, is calling me out for going to that lame one in London. Did you did you hear about this one? No. Modern front ends back in November. Modern oh, front ends yeah. live. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, to be honest, I don't really know what happened, but mm -hmm. I, a lot of, I, I know that something happened. In that. Yep. People were upset about lots it. of lots of organizational things were a mess. For what it's worth, because of the group of people that we had there, we actually had an amazing time, like hanging out with friends and meeting people for the first time and stuff. 
Uh, but there were lots of like different conversation, but lots of things that went on. There's a, I've got a video on that if people are interested. Nibby's referencing like tons of people wrote blog posts and did videos about their experience too. So if you want to learn about that experience, uh, there are plenty of opportunities too. Cool. Uh, that, well, I guess we could do, um, yeah, so we could do show the shell. So if we run, I went the wrong way. Go back here. Run in here. Now uh, we the will. CLI, the CLI is fully open source, right? So just oh, cool. Like, okay. People, people want to check it out. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Nibby is asking. There were no cameras. Yeah, like part of the story is they promised people to be able to live stream, and then said they were having issues with live stream, but there were never any cameras to begin with. So that felt like a lie from the beginning. But again, like different conversation, probably for a different day, but. Uh, let's see. So this, I assume like this SQL. This is just SQL. Yes. Just SQL light syntax. Before. Oh, so you can, interesting. So you can just select. Yes. A string and then rename yeah. it. And then okay. select, select one is my favorite SQL. Command. <laughs> I don't know about it. Cause you think you always need a table and blah, blah, blah. And oh, I need a semicolon. Yeah. Yeah. I always make that mistake. Is there a way to get back like after. If I return, oh, can I just type it after that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, I've made that mistake yeah. many times in like SQL um, terminals or whatever. Cool. Should we should we go ahead and create like a basic user table just in here through the commands? Do it. Do it like that. Spice it up. Yeah. Cool. And Python is my favorite calculator, but you can use SQL as well. Python is your favorite calculator? Yes, yeah, so Nibi just said that you can use SQL as your calculator. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the things you can do that yeah. you probably don't need to do. <laughs> well, ChatGPT is going to be my new calculator now. Yes. That Chat GB, I'm using ChatGPT every day for more and more things. Um, all right, let's see. So we created a table users. We inserted a user with the idea is user one and then a, a test email and then we can select star from users. Cool, works, basic stuff, but terminal in here to do what we want. And then do you think, uh, so I just like, I guess you could do the quit command to get out, cool. Yeah. Do you think we should set this up inside of like configure this a node? And I think we can actually run this like before actually connecting to the, the real deploy database, we can run this with just yeah. a local file. Do you want to like talk about that setup first? Yeah. So that this is this is something I like a lot. Um, and essentially, again, this is still Leap SQL, but think SQLite, right? It's a fork of SQLite. Uh, that's why we fork. By the way, we didn't rewrite it. Uh, we had this idea in the beginning. Let's just rewrite a compatible. We've done this before with Scylla. Uh, but if you start with a fork, uh, you're not compatible from day one. Uh, and if you have the discipline to keep this compatibility, you're always compatible. You don't have to rush to that point. Uh, so if you can just run this locally and, and uh, all of our SDK or all of our libraries are prepared to uh, work either locally or remotely. So when you, when you configure the SDK, there are instructions uh, about, about that in documentation. If you put file column and do a file, you're in a local SQLite file. You can drop it in your CI. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do all sorts of tests with that. Uh, and then if you pass the URL and the token, you're doing this remotely, right? So just uh... yeah, it's pretty it's pretty unique, I think, because that's one of the challenges with hosted database services is like in testing is how do you automatically like create new databases and seed it with the correct information so you know you're getting the same thing every time. But if you're just like basically a flat file in your yeah, you can you can add your the file code. to your CI, right? Just mm -hmm. that, that we do a lot uh, in here. Yep. As well. Cool. So uh, for context, inside of Node, I've got a basic Express app running that's going to run on port 3000. And then uh, we'll just add in the SDK. So this is a libsql client. And there's two different imports. We're going to use the regular client. Do you want to talk about the difference between like regular client slash the one that's for or labeled as web? Yeah. So the web, the web one is really for environments where you don't have any other infrastructure than HTTP and WebSocket. So one of the things that doesn't work is the local file. 
because uh, there's nothing local there. Uh, one example is Cloudflare workers. Right? So Cloudflare workers, there's no concept of anything they can run locally. Mm -hmm. uh, or another example, the browser. So you can run this from the browser and like uh, you, you will need the web package. Uh, the fetch is different. Lots of things are different. So you don't have any any of that node environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and the and the regular client is the when, when you have access to all of that. Yep. And that's, we talked about some of the like, not necessarily difficulties, but like some of the complexities that come along with adopting the edge is a lot of the things that you're used to running just don't work in the edge because you don't have access to the same API or the full set of APIs that you expect in Node. And that's what like there's, I hear all these rumblings of like the idea of getting to like a, a unified I don't even know what you'd call it, like a unified web platform where the APIs have like um, parity across the board. I don't really know. But for now, there's like, there's browser, JavaScript, there's Node.js, there's Dino, there's is uh, Bun is the other, like different runtimes and, and, and ways that you can run JavaScript, but then have access to different things or not have access to certain things. Uh, I thought, James, I thought there were too many databases in the world. And then <laughs> And then I learned about JavaScript frameworks, which is. <laughs> well, did you think there were too many databases in the world before or after you created one? <laughs> uh, no, but th that's that's why our first product in the company was not really a database. Was not that, yeah. That's so like uh, not a database, but then like uh, mm -hmm. when when we started div diving into like the JavaScript world, like uh, there's so there's so many like an incompatible yep. stuff out there, but like it's just uh, 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 we have a Rust SDK as well. The Rust SDK does not have this difference, just mm. as an example. Like between, it's just uh, 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 just the Rust SDK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Doug, comment in the chat. Screencast. I assume I was kind of like delayed by a few seconds of putting the screen back on the yeah. uh, for everybody. See, so, yeah, I think that's what you're referring to. If there's something else that I'm missing, uh, just let me know. Uh, so we're importing the create client, and uh, then we want to use it based on the URL and the auth token, which we haven't done an auth token yet. Yeah, but this um, is the step in which if you just do file, mm -hmm. uh, you, then you don't need the auth token, right? Just uh, And it's just file, not, uh, not file slash slash, yeah. File colon and the name of the file. Okay, and is that gonna look relative to the directory that we're in? Yeah. Okay, so just db.sql? For example, yeah. Okay, and then can I, should I comment out the auth token or does it matter? That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is connecting to local DB file, and I can just create an empty file in here? Uh, if you want to assume that there is a table running, for example, you just do SQL i3 uh, db.sql. SQL white 3 Yeah. db.sql like that? Yeah, the same name, right? Just to... And that'll generate the file, for, like generate the... Yeah, that, will open, that will open the SQL shell. And now you can, for example, mm. create a table. Right? The same okay. You have a... Oh, and then I can go back through. I've got these up. So create table. That's right, yeah. And then you can insert. Insert or whatever you want to do. In and then select star from users. Also, one of, the, so one of the biggest hacks, I don't know if people caught like what I was doing there, but I've got a multiple clipboard history tool where I can... I can scroll back and forth through the last like hundred things that I've copied to my clipboard, which is immensely useful. It's like one of my favorite things that I think most people don't have. Um, so I would highly recommend people look into one of that. And, and of for, for, just to highlight this for your audience, like uh, obviously you use the SQL i3 shell. Mm -hmm. So everything that's happening now is just local. You're not talking to tourists. Yep. It's just mm -hmm. like, uh, and you can put this file as is. Now the file was created. You can put this yep. file as is in your see what the binary of this looks like it looks great <laughs> um peter is saying or i, I assume that's how you pronounce that Piotr. um is a Piotr. okay uh the bash completion should work with torso cli like regular regular bash? yeah regular bash completion the stuff that you mentioned figure mm. i've never heard about that before but... okay um it may Fig may also override that stuff for me. So it may it may look as if it doesn't work for me, but that's because Fig is probably overriding that. But uh, Blaze is saying we'll try Torso in the next product release of AdTech. Might disturb the, the Torso team about 
questions, Piotr, feature requests. Piotr is yeah. Polish, so he goes by Piotr J because if he writes his last name, nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've had to make decisions yeah. to like embrace my middle initial because there's a James Quick that played professional football in the U.S. and so SEO value was not there if it's just James yeah. Quick. So I've had to like make adoptions to my name or embrace the middle initial at least. Um, let's say, okay. So this should initialize the client. And then I guess the one thing we want to do in here is just show a basic, um, a basic query so we can kind of copy in a snippet here. And make this an async function so we can use a wait. And so we use our client, we call execute, and then we're just throwing in uh, just throwing in raw SQL statements. In this By the case. way, the table you created is called users. The table in there is exactly mm. users. So just do it to match. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. And then we should be able to return back. I love, do you use GitHub Copilot, by the way? I, I've not been using it, no. But okay. I've been using like a, now, now that I'm a CEO, like I've been coding so little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it makes perfect sense then yeah. for having less time to code. Let yeah. Copilot do more of it for you. <laughs> okay, well, so that lots should... of people in the team are using it. I'm a, I'm a mm -hmm. huge fan of the, of the whole AI thing. I didn't use it for a while, specifically because I create so much content that it's hard to. I feel like it's hard to teach. Yeah. When it's just like throwing out the the code. Um. So I'm I haven't quite figured out how to use that, but I'm really happy to have it back in my workflow, and then I'll probably like turn it off when I'm recording videos. So I think we just did this at the root index. Nope. This is running at a different port. This is another project that I'm working on, which is not the one that we're trying to do now. Uh... Oh, and this little, that's good. I didn't tell myself what, so it's not starting on. Interesting, is this one still running? It is. Now it works. Interesting. I don't know how it allowed those two processes to run on the same port. Or maybe Node just doesn't have a way to to fail? I would... Likely you fail and then catch the error, right? Yeah. Interesting. Um, anyway, have back the data in here. So the, the main thing we probably care about in this case is the rows. I can... Yeah. And and interesting in here. to note that James that like uh, again we do have the SDKs uh, for you to deal with that in any language. But just a reminder, this is all plain HTTP back and forth, right? Uh, so you, you could curl it uh, and mm -hmm. curl the database and get the get the results back. Cool, perfect, sweet. Um, so that is working again. Like just to kind of reiterate the local stuff, you can have local embedded file that you use as your database. You could have um, seed functions like in a CI CD thing, make sure your database looks exactly like you want for your testing, run test against this, not have to have any like additional cloud infrastructure or deployment. Zero. And, and then just the switch of two things, I guess, but mainly the URL and then also adding your auth token yeah. when you're actually connecting to your Churso, uh database. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Um, Nibby says, I'm so used to my programs crashing. Yes. <laughs> And Doug, yeah, so to Doug's point, I would have expected a socket error address and use. Same. I'm, I'm not sure how we got away with that. But anyway, working now. And it's also weird that it, like as soon as I closed the other thing running, this thing was ready. Like I didn't have to restart it. But anyway. So should we swap this out now for a deployed instance of the database? Let's do it, yeah. And again, going back through... This one. So that was the URL I copied earlier. And just for context, no, I don't know if if, uh, if this will matter or not. We have an extra space at the end. Hmm. It. Yeah. I wonder if it does like a yeah. a trim. I would understand if it didn't, and then the connection failed because I feel like it's not a good idea to leave extra white space in there anyway. So. <laughs> and what was so is it DB show? Is that right? And then my DB. And then there's a separate command if you go back to the documentation to get the token, right? Okay. Yep. So just to show people again, like if to get these database credentials, you do your show 
this will give you your URL. And now we'll go back to, um, oh, interesting. So this is actually worth talking about because I, I copied both of these earlier and we didn't talk about it. So uh, Doug is mentioning the idea of the logical database URL versus the instance right. URL, which actually is very important. Can you talk about what the difference between those two are? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't talk about it in the beginning, but uh, what is the edge, right? So before the quote unquote edge, you could still do geographically replicated things. Like this mm -hmm. is not new. Uh, I compared this a lot to like the cloud. The cloud was not new as well. It was just like renting servers. But it came with this infrastructure to make the act of renting servers transparent. Doug hates when I say the word transparent. <laughs> uh, but like the, the, the edges, the edges are automatic. Let's let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. But the but the the edge is similar, right? So one of the things that we're trying to do with this whole edge push is that you should write an application without worrying where exactly yep. your things are, and then the edge infrastructure routes you to the right place. So yep. that is one of the things between the, that's that's the main difference between the the instance ID uh, and or URL and the logical URL. The so logical, the logical yep. URL, when you query that, you will always query the closest replica. Yep. Right, and this 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 routing is done for you. But for whatever if for whatever reason you want to go to a specific primary for test reasons for debugging, you uh, can you can go to a specific instance. So if you were to create a replica now, you would see a different instance URL uh, mm -hmm. in there. But yep. you, you wouldn't have to, when you create this replica, you don't have to change. And that is why it's the best practice to use the logical uh, URL. You don't have to change that. So let's say you, you see a, a bunch of users coming from Japan that were not coming before. You can create a replica there. You will see that creating a replica is very quick. Uh, so you, you can even do this ephemerally, create a replica, handle the traffic for a couple of hours, shut it down. Your application doesn't have to change because you're always querying the logical URL. And the, the flip side of that, the manual piece of that, which I've done as well, is you have an environment variable in your code that tells you like which region you're, you're running in. Yeah. And then based on that region, you have a list of different connection strings and you use the one based on the environment that you're running in manually in code, having to make those decisions, yeah. which is not yeah. fun. And that really yeah. does take away the scalability of being able to have all these instances across the world and then have it be routed um, appropriately by the infrastructure that's already there. Cool. Matthias joining us on uh, Twitch. What's up, Matthias? Hey there. Uh, cool. So that... Uh, we've got the logical now. So this is the one where basically you're going to take care of routing this to the most appropriate database instance, which is perfect. And then auth token is the command turbo DB token. And then the name of the database that we're looking to generate a token for. Yes. Uh, you did, said turbo. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Actually, turbo Pascal. Days yep. <laughs> My bad. Uh, did I miss a flag in here? DB command... Tokens. Token. See typos. Uh, Nivi is asking, does that use the fly DNS for finding the nearest instance? Uh, we use a lot of the fly infrastructure, but there's a lot more of our infrastructure on top of that as well. Maybe just go to the docs. Yeah. We still, or there, there's a create. Yeah. The uh, which one? There you go. Tokens create. Yeah. yeah. And then um, you also set an expiration in the, just for the sorry. purpose of test that we just set the expiration to none. Okay. Uh, so, but I don't have to specify that in this case, right? Uh, if you don't specify, then it has a default expiration that I don't even remember what it is. It should okay. be enough for the stream. But just... Right. That's what I was assuming. Yeah. That one. Cool. So this whole thing, and this will be deleted after the stream. So people can have fun with it in the next 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and I would typically, best practices, I would put this in environment variable, load this in without ENV for demo purposes. We'll just like, we'll just run this in here. And let's go ahead and run the server again and come back to our endpoint. And you didn't really see me refresh, but I refresh and it's pulling the same data, which is exactly what we'd expect. Um, the interesting thing that we could pay attention to 
is on the network request. Will it show my initial load in here? Where's my timing on this? Explanation. Is this the total? Or maybe in the waiting for the server to respond maybe is probably the most important? Probably, yeah. The 38 milliseconds. So this is going all locally. Uh, actually, no, that's not true. Mostly geographically with, local. Yeah. yeah, you can compare that with the SQLite file or create new replicas. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we, if we did this a couple of times, and this is 57 milliseconds, uh, 174. That's just variations, I think, in node somewhere. Well, somewhere in that range. And then if we uh, swap this out to go back. Copy that and go back. Well, I would I would just uh, comment out the whole token fire thing, right? Just to... no. Uh, and then do a request. We're down to eight milliseconds. So the difference between like we're actually proving that we're going out to a server, I guess, is the main case, main point. And then now, I guess what we can do is like kind of keep that forty-five millisecond threshold or so, and then deploy a new region of this, you and then force it to go to that further array region, then we should see some differences in times. Yeah, and uh, one thing about replication is that in our model, uh, you always have a primary. Uh, for the folks who understand databases mm. and consistency yeah. models, et cetera, if you're talking about 30 regions, 20 regions, whatever, you're not gonna have a full consensus protocol for consistency, so that's not, that's unworkable. The model that we work with is snapshot isolation. So you always read the transaction boundary. You never read any inconsistent data, but it's still passive replication, right? Yep. So when you create the database, you're going to create it on a primary. And in your case, was a close to you, uh, right? But now, now that you have a database close to you, like uh, you're always going to get that, right? So, so if you if you leave it to the logical routing uh, to pick the database, you will never you should never be going mm -hmm. to uh, the, the the foreign ones. Right? Yep. Anthony AJC on Twitch. What's up? What's up? Welcome. Yeah. Uh, so there's a snippet in here and it has uh, creating a replication, but specifically for Japan or Tokyo, Japan, which I think is perfect for this. Mm -hmm. So this, this means we're basically pushing this as far away from where I am as possible. Um, Nibby is asking maybe a clarification. Can you talk a little bit more about the asynchronous, what asynchronous replication means? Uh, Again, not sure what exactly Nibi wants to know from that, but the way it works, uh, let me know if you answer your question. If not, follow up at the car. The, you, you can write, by the way, from any location. Uh, the whole thing about our edge infrastructure is that you don't have to be aware of any of that. So from mm -hmm. any endpoint, from any location, you can write. Those writes, though, are forwarded trend, uh, automatically to the primary. Uh, and then it is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but like a asynchronous replication, I don't think I know what it is because it could be many <laughs> things like the fact that do we replicate as soon as we as yeah. we rep, we do replicate as soon as uh, as the write happens. Uh, so that I guess in this case, it is asynchronous in the case that the write doesn't wait for it, right? So just uh, when you, when you write, you don't you don't wait for all the replications to happen, yep. right? So that in that case, it's asynchronous, right? <laughs> Yep. There is no, there is no like consensus protocol, and there is no, there is no, there is no necessity to have all the replicas being live, right? So the replicas can come and go at any time. Yep. I know, like details of how that gets implemented, the replication process become come down to like application specific needs, because there's there's a potential need for like I'm willing for my write to be a lot slower. Mm -hmm. If I guarantee that if I read that after I've if after I write it, I can read it from anywhere at the exact same time. But yes. probably the more common example is what you're saying, where I write it and it's it's going to be available just yeah. however milliseconds in, or in, in a couple of seconds second later. Yep. Because it's not only about latency; is that when you're dealing with like geographically distributed networks like that, you can always have partitions. Uh, you can always have parts of the network that are offline. Uh, so, I mean, mm. what we're doing here yeah. with two or three replicas, you could do synchronously and have a consensus protocol. Uh, but when you really push this to, like, obviously, again, this is the starter plan. This is the free tier. It allows you to create up to three locations. 
for most people, we hope using this in production, they're going to be creating replicas uh, everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the asynchronous model is the only one that uh, we believe works. Yep. Cool. So this generated a new URL, and this one would be for the specific for instance. Specific instance, yes. And yes, okay. So let's take this. I'm going to comment out the one above, paste this in here. We'll start with that. Now, what we should see is the request time with me locally hitting my local node server running. The response that comes back is going to take a lot longer because it's actually going to go all, basically all the way across the world to interact with a database. So that's what we should see in, in the uh, network request in the browser. You can, you can get, uh, as you can see in, the, uh, in your command line as well, the shell can also take that parameter. Right. So if you want, you can also go uh, use the shell to connect to a specific replica. Mm, okay, so you can you can do stuff right inside of the shell to a specific instance. And, and what, what you can, if you want to demonstrate that, what you will see is that you can, even in this replica in Japan, you can still write. You don't mm -hmm. have to connect to the primary to write. Okay. The write has to, the write has to go all yep. the way to the primary, right? It's not, it's not magic, but uh, you, you can do it. You don't have to be aware of where, where those things are. That's really helpful as well because I've seen other databases where you do have that limitation of you want to you, you want to show that James before you run. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, just so oh, sorry. So uh, just copy the whole thing or just the. Uh, so what would what would be the oh it's right there sorry yeah. yep. I was gonna make up the command myself. So going into the shell, connecting specifically to this instance that is in. Um, Japan. Japan is where we said, and then I'm just I'm not gonna try to type SQL live, so just I am going to. Users, right? just the, yeah, or two. I'm gonna paste in another and food two dot com whatever. Um, so I guess like do I guess we could do the it's like star from here just to show that it popped up. So there it is, and this is this is a really big benefit because. Like I said earlier, there's other database options that have re like strictly read replicas, which is great. Like has also a significant impact on like reading times for data across replicated instances. But in this case, in that case, you had to have two different URLs. Basically, mm -hmm. one is for either the specific instance that you're reading from geographically, or a logical instance that you're reading from, and then maybe a separate URL that's specifically for the instance that you're going to be able to connect to and write. But in this case, you don't have to worry about either one of those. You have one logical URL that handles both That's the reads and the writes for you. That's right. And again, there's no consistency issues uh, because the, this write was proxied for you to mm -hmm. the main location, right? But you can you don't you don't have to be worried about any of that. And the proxy, does that mean that the write? So even though I'm not telling it to go to master, does that mean it's proxying to actually send the write to master first? Yes. Okay, and then because, then the replication the process. Always, the writes always go to the primary. Cool, but you don't have to worry about that because the proxy takes care of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So let's just run from here, I think. That's right. Right, so we'll run this application. We will open back up our port. And remember, two seconds was when we were running with a local file, which also just like from a testing or from a development perspective makes tons of sense because one, it's faster. Two, you don't have to rely on like an external service. You're kind of isolated to your own environment, which is nice. Um, and then the other metric that we had was around 45 milliseconds, Artists. mostly is what it was. Yeah. And then uh, we'll see when we come back. So 215 milliseconds, I'll just refresh. 212, 214, 205. I think we saw like one or two outliers originally with the locally deployed instance yeah. of like 145, but this is noticeably different especially compared to the average of 45 versus in this case, like 200 plus. So the difference between querying an instance that is relatively local, like in the Eastern U S versus on the other side of the world makes a big difference. Yeah. And Nib is asking if this is all transparent, it's all transparent. So again, you could be using curl uh, and all mm -hmm. of this infrastructure will be there for you. Uh, the client is really, really simple. Yeah. Yep. Do so do people have questions about and what's your take on the idea of something like a Prisma? Um, I, I think some people may look at like writing raw SQL stuff versus using it versus using an ORM like Prisma. 
what are your thoughts on using something like Prisma in this case, specifically in the context of like the edge and the benefits that we hope to get out of the edge? Uh, so conceptually, I think ORMs make sense. Uh, the problem with Prisma is that uh, Prisma, they do seem to be improving in that regard, but going back to the conversation that I had mm -hmm. with you, they're not really architected for a edge uh, environment. So they have uh, lots of work to do, but also you wouldn't be able today to use uh, Thurso uh, with Prisma. Okay. Because like they have, you would essentially have to add support for them, which we're right. willing to do. I mean, they would they would have to accept the contributions. Mm -hmm. But you have a SQLite thing for Prisma, but that is essentially something SQLite tends to be something compiled to your binary. So you can't just like with Postgres and MySQL just change the connection. Yeah. Uh, there is a project that we love. Uh, as a matter of fact, we uh, again we work with open source for twenty years. Uh, we understand the, the need to, to sustain the ecosystem. So there is a project called Drizzle that we are financially sponsoring them. They're not affiliated with us, but they started looking for sponsors. And we found, you know, for us, it's the perfect opportunity. Uh, Drizzle has been very aggressively uh, adding support for uh, new data, new HTTP based databases like Cloudflare D1. Uh, so, you know, we just decided to sponsor them. They are, they're also looking very strongly into the edge paradigm. They're super fast loads extremely well. So if you are doing any edge deployments and want an ORM, uh, I would say just take a look at Drizzle. Uh, and this cool. support, I mean, Turso uh, is, uh, is first class support for them. That's cool. I hadn't heard of Drizzle before, so I'm interested to, Super to see what that's like. Super new project, three guys from Ukraine. They're, uh, by the mm -hmm. way, they're looking for sponsorships on GitHub. If you have like 10 okay. bucks to spare, uh, you help them a lot. And they've, they've been doing, they've been doing waves. Uh, Bytes.dev published a, uh, the other day, they, they published a very nice article about Drizzle. Uh, I've been, I've not seen yet a lot of noise about Drizzle, but we're seeing noise about Drizzle in all of the channels that we believe are leading indicators. The relevant ones, yeah. <laughs> success. So like, uh, I think you're going to be hearing more and more about it. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I feel like a lot of my and, and many people's perspective is like overnight success. Like you all of a sudden, so-and-so is taking the development world by storm. And that's that's cool. But the reality is, that product has been like in the works for probably several years before it kind of hits that mass uh, mass adoption. The success happens slowly and then suddenly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and most people just think about the suddenly part. <laughs> Are there any? Um, well, one. Any additional questions in the chat? Let us know. We can kind of use that as wrapping up talking points. But any like last thoughts from? For, from you or maybe a piece of advice as people are like looking to build applications and modern ar architecture, whether that's serverless or edge or whatever it is going forward. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the great advice for builders is always like, do yeah. it. just, uh, and again, we have a discord channel. that we're always happy to onboard people to talk to yeah. people. You can hang around. Like uh, we don't have to, uh, you don't have to talk necessarily just about Thurso. Uh, you can you see our community as a community of people who love yeah. the edge, right? And uh, uh, we're always happy to talk about it. So Nib is asking if there is any UDF support in LibSQL. Uh, if you remember the open source project, we have uh, support for UDFs in WebAssembly. So you can essentially write in any language, compile to WebAssembly. Uh, we, yeah. we but that we don't we don't expose that into Torso yet. Hopefully that's coming in in the couple, next couple of months. But, yeah. What is what is UDF? I search user, and it's user defined function. So you can essentially uh, okay. function, right? Okay. Um, and let's say you want to encrypt those values. Uh, you, you, they, you, you can have a encrypt function, and then instead of doing select user, yeah. you can say select encrypt user, and then you already get right. the value encrypted because okay. uh, the database itself is executing this function before returning the value to you. Right. right? Yep. And we do that, that with WebAssembly, as I said, in the LibSQL project, but that is not exposed to the Torso commercial product yet. Uh, maybe mm. if that is something you would be interested in using, show up at Discord. Let's chat about it. <laughs> uh, we have we haven't we haven't added we haven't added to uh, Torso mostly out of priorities for right? just a tiny to, yep. to do stuff. But it, obviously, we would love to do it. Uh, yep. Do you use any standards such as Wazi or Waji? No, actually, the functions they they don't do any I/O at the moment. They're just um, but uh, I think Wazi is the thing that we're going to be using. That's awesome. I, I searched um, UDF and the first thing that popped up was United Dairy Farmers. And I assumed that wasn't what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, Christy just joined us on Twitch. We're kind of wrapping up, Christy, but glad you uh, glad you stopped by. 
And so the I kind of put you on the spot for like advice for people going forward. The interesting thing I think is like proving out the need for this sort of stuff. Um, because again, we like we hype up the concept of edge, we like almost in a bad way, like throw it out there, like this is this is the thing that you need and it's gonna solve all the problems and stuff, but it really comes from like understanding what specific problems it solves and use cases, but then looking at like the ecosystem and seeing things like databases and ORMs and tools and stuff catching up with discussion, the promise. Discussion, James, every year in the industry, mm-hmm. people never yep. learn. It's like, a, <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it the same thing with AI now? And like, I, yep. you know, I don't, I don't think AI is going to be like sentient or like solve all the problems. But as we, as we use, we are understanding, for example, mm-hmm. what, what is this tool good for? What is this yep. tool bad for? So we know, for example, that things like Copilot uh, work very well as like a helper for writing your code, but it's not going to work that well to like design a complex application. Yep. Uh, same thing with the cloud, same thing with the edge, same thing with MongoDB's web scale, if you're old enough to remember that, right? <laughs> so you have to cut through the noise and understand like, what is this good for? What is this not good for? Uh, and again, I think the edge paradigm is really good for people who expect users from multiple geographical locations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't have to be Japan and the United States. I mean, even within the United States, right? You, have There's, regions, you get multiple regions. Yeah, right? it's a massive uh, space. That's a good uh, point. And, and and need that that lower latency, right? So if you need uh, latency, uh, and if you're fighting for tens of twenty milliseconds uh, for load time, that matters. And again, mm-hmm. why would you do that? Because it translates into load time. It's a better experience for your users. But some applications don't need that you're not going to do a batch yep. processing of anything in in the edge like just to... yeah i think those are all really good points um and the more collectively we understand about the tools that we have at our disposable or disposable our disposal the um the better off we'll be that was deep yeah boom <laughs> <laughs> that's my mic drop moment of the day <laughs> Uh, cool. Let me let me do one more time. Let me grab a link to uh, to Discord just to make sure people have that if they want to uh, join. So if you have follow up questions, you can feel free to reach out to me, and I can either answer and or connect people most likely to get like real answers. But uh, I think Discord is is probably the number one uh, place for people to go. Are there any? I will I will put you on the spot for like any. Let's do it. Are there any specific features or things that are in progress that are coming that you're excited about? Or you can also say, like, we haven't shared that stuff publicly. <laughs> uh, no, there, there are a couple of things that, uh, and, and again, LibSeq will be an open source thing. It's very, mm-hmm. I, I love to look at, like, what's happening there as a yep. review of what's, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, user-defined functions and WebAssembly is one example. Mm-hmm. Like, we would love to add this to the platform. Yeah. The other thing that we are starting to see contributions coming from, community contributions as well, mm-hmm. is CRDTs. Uh, so CRDTs, for those of you who don't know, or uh, I keep forgetting what the acronym means. It's like conflict-free replicated data structure, something like that. James, look it up for us. I'm trying. Yeah, conflict-free yeah. replicated data type. Type types. I've got. Yeah. I, yeah, I got the T wrong. <laughs> uh, but translating that, although I, I keep forgetting the acronym, uh, what mm-hmm. CRDTs allow you to do is they allow you to do local writes at the edge or things like that because you're writing, uh, I'm oversimplifying a lot, but essentially what you're doing is that you're writing deltas. Like you're essentially writing Mm -hmm. something and say, hey, if you have a conflict uh, with some other thing, this is how you resolve this conflict, right? So it's a a data type, it's a data structure that comes back with a conflict resolution mechanism that all the replicas agree to. So that allows you to do like local writes to your local uh, your your local replica in your in your location, mm. uh, and then every now and then those things are synced uh, through all the replicas. You have some guarantees of when the sync is going to happen, and you you guarantee that because uh, this conflict resolution will play the same way in all of the replicas. Eventually, they all gonna converge to the same state. Right? So that okay. that is used for like local first applications, uh, things like Figma, uh, things like that. So you can you're always mm. like drawing your Google Docs mm. or whatnot. So we're super excited because uh, writes, as you can imagine, you're not going to be using Turso today with an application that writes very heavily. Like SQLite itself is not known to be like very write heavy. Uh, and then you also have the thing that the writes are always going to uh, for consistency. Uh, primary. primary. Uh, but what, with CRDTs, you can actually achieve. Uh, and and what, we, what, what is being worked on by the community is an extension to, to LibSQL to allow like, for native uh, CRDT data types. 
So instead of having an integer type, you could, ha you could have like a CRGT type. Uh, and whenever you write to those types, those writes are local, right? Hmm. Okay. So excited about that as well. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's cool to see like, um, going back to the UDF part, like something that was already on your radar, people ask about for feature set. And that's like, as you build a business, you can't build or a product, you can't build everything up front. So it's all about like, well, what are people actually going to use? So it's good to get a, like one piece of validation of that being something people are interested in early on. Cool. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, call it. I'm going to, for people who are watching on Twitch, I'm going to raid, uh, send you over to bald. Shouldn't have done this because now I have to type it. Bald bearded builder. I'm going to send you over to his channel. He's great. Um, so enjoy his stream. But thanks everyone for listening, asking questions. Uh, thank you for joining and you, helping Jay. me walk through and explain all these concepts. And... Uh, we will catch everybody next time. See ya. Right, thank you.